Brooke, how are you? I am well. How are you? Good, good, good. Uh, today we're going to talk about a recent appellate court decision, and it deals with the issue of a work seek order. And what's the name of the case? It's Haley versus Antonovich. Okay. I hope I'm not butchering that. I no, apologize. I don't think you are. I, I think that uh, you got it as close as I could get it. Uh, the case was in Alameda County, and it deals with an issue that we don't see very often. And I'm going to tell you that I thought this was interesting because I personally have never asked a court to impose a work seek order. Well, that was actually something I was going to ask you about. I have never heard that term, work seek order. I've heard of imputation. Right. I've heard of you know, vocational exams, but I've never heard of a work seek order. Yeah, and now after reading this decision, I have some thoughts that I'll share at the end of this. But why don't we set up the facts of the case and uh, and see what happens uh, in our analysis. For the, for the viewers out here, uh, this is a child support matter. Uh, child support is highly regulated in the state of California. Uh, there's some policies that are pretty strong that both parents have the obligation to support their children according to the best interests of the kids. And I'll stop here and ask you to go ahead and give us some basic facts of this case. Of course. And I was actually going to start with just a reminder for the viewers, but you already did it, that basically everything that has to do with children is, you know, what's in the best interest of them. So viewers, please keep that in mind. Um, our husband and wife were married, of course, and then they divorced, and there was a child support order put into effect. Um, I can't remember. The, the amount was a, a little over $1,000 a month, um, and at that time, dad had about 20% custody and mom had 80 Um Yeah, so his income was $15,000 per month, and he paid her, the wife, we'll just refer to her as wife, I guess, or mother, what we refer to as mother. Mother, okay. Uh, 1525 per month. Okay, perfect. Um, and so at some point, he starts getting more custody, um, and she has not gotten a job. She has not started working, um, and he goes in to modify the support order. An interesting note is that she is receiving a fairly big amount from her parent or her father, um, I actually thought this was going to become a, a Williams alter case or Williamson alter case, but it, it didn't. The decision uh, alludes to that, and that's dealing with the idea of a reoccurring gift from a parent, whether the trial court can use that as support. Yeah, exactly. So there was a little bit of a discussion with that, but let me not interrupt you. Go ahead. So the trial court found in favor of father, and they reduced um, his child support uh, obligation and she appealed. Mother appealed. Um, the appellate court. Well, the, the trial court also issued a work seek order for her, right? And she was appealing the work seek order. I think she was appealing both. Both, okay. Um, but yes, you are right. That <laughs> work seek, it's like in one ear, out the yeah. other, because it's just not something I understand or really have well, ever let, heard let's, of. Let's let's talk about what a work seek order is. I looked at the code. And 4505 of the Family Code, California Family Code, states that, and this is, I think, which is why this was a published decision, because the code reads, a court may require a parent who alleges that the parent's default in a child or family support order is due to the parent's unemployment to submit to an appropriate child support enforcement agency or any other entity designated by the court, including but not limited to the court itself, each two weeks or at a frequency deemed appropriate by the court, a list of at least five different places the parent has applied for employment. Now, the reason why I'm reading this section is it says that a court may require a parent who alleges that the parent's default in a child or family support order. Typically, you know, I think this code was kind of written for the receiver of child support because it's talking about a default uh, due to the parent's unemployment, right? But it really cuts both ways because mm -hmm. of the public policy that California has. Both parents are equally responsible for the care and support of their children. So I think that might be why this is published, because it was being used against a, a supported person rather than the supporting person. Which is very different, like you were saying. You were actually the one who explained to me how child support 
became a thing, why we're using guideline, and it's basically that, you know, we don't, the state doesn't want to have to care for children, it's up to the parents, right. and both parents are equally obligated to do that. Yeah, and the decision talks a little bit about that public mm-hmm. policy, that uh, the law strongly favors private people to pay for their children and not the government. Exactly. Um, so mother appeals. Um, one of her arguments was basically that if child support was reduced, she would not be able to live her lifestyle. And because there was a shortfall already, right? Mm-hmm. Which I know she was represented at the time of the appeal, but I don't. I, I wonder if she was represented before that because that is there's a couple things in here that I would never have allowed my or I would have asked my client not to say. So so let's let's make it uh, clear for the uh, viewers. Uh, she was receiving ninety thousand dollars a year from her father. Yes. Right, and uh, she said that that plus the uh, money that she received in child support of fifteen twenty five per month presently creates a shortfall. So she needed uh, him to actually increase. He was at, She was asking the court to increase the number, even though he had facts that he had decreased, his income had decreased. I actually, no, his income had actually, oddly enough, had increased slightly. Oh, did it? Just okay. slightly, but his time with the time child share. had increased significantly, 22%. Okay. Yeah, so, so his support obligation would go down because mm-hmm. of the fact that the time that he spent with the child now is greater than it was when the order was exactly. initiated. And therefore, under the guideline formula, he would pay less support. So even though he's entitled to a downward modification, she's saying, well, I actually want him to pay more because he should be making up the shortfall because I cannot make it with my $90,000 a year income from my parent and the inco- and the support that is being paid. The quote was, uh, she could not afford such a decrease because she was un- because she was unemployed and relied on Haley's child support and her father's monthly gifts to survive and adequately care for the child. Right. Okay. What else do we need to know about this case? Um the so the court ultimately the trial court ultimately did reduce the ch- monthly child support to $891 retroactive, of course. Um, which and, which was important here because it also ordered that she pay him back for the overpayment, mm-hmm. and the and so the way that it was going to do this, it, he had, he was allowed to deduct out per month. I think it was like two hundred bucks a month in order t- for her to pay him back because she owed him um, over forty four hundred dollars. Okay. Just... Okay. Good. That's a nice chunk of change. Exactly. Um, so, spoiler alert: the uh, appellate court did find in favor of the trial court, and um, they go through a nice discussion of why. Um, they agree that California has a strong public policy in favor of adequate child support. I think all the courts are in favor of that. It's just how do we get to that point? Um, they were mentioning in remarriage of Hine, which is a 2020 case, um, that a parent's first and principal obligation is to support the parent's minor children according to the parent's circumstances and station in life. And both parents are mutually responsible for the support of their children, which is basically a retelling of the the bedrock of family law. Right. Um they were looking at this as an abuse of discretion, which is a pretty high standard, um, and they still found that the trial court had done the right thing. Um, and then they really did look at mother's own statements establishing that she couldn't pay for for her uh, expenses and the child's expenses, uh, even with the support that she was getting from her parents or father and the support she was getting from uh, dad. And this goes to the work seek order because what she said is, is that, um, you know, again, I have a shortfall and I can't make it with what it was. If she hadn't said that, there probably would be no basis for a work seat order or possibly not because this wasn't a motion to impute income to her. 
but when she said there would be a shortfall to adequately support the child, now she's created a scenario where this child needs to be supported and the responsibility was hers. And I thought that was interesting that, you know, she made that blunder in her arguments. Let's, let's not forget that this child was only five years old. And, you know, I've seen in a lot of cases trial courts uh, not want to make people, you know, find jobs, uh, not impute income to parents with small children. But when she said that, I think that that was a very significant part of the appellate court's analysis here. I think you're right. And then I also think once she said that, it was almost like a domino effect. So then they looked at the child being in preschool. So why isn't she able to work even part time? Um, and, and the trial court said they would be willing to work around her schedule. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, we're, you know, you should find a job that works around your schedule. We'll be OK with that. So this particular uh, mother had a bachelor's degree and had previously previously been employed uh, so it wasn't like she had never worked before. It didn't go into what her prior employment was, but going back to the trial court's willingness to allow her to work around the child's schedule, it wasn't asking for her to go out and you know sock, earn a whole bunch of money. Mm-hmm. You know, it was it was something where it was just saying just make up the difference. I think they even said um, I know I highlighted it, but minimum they said wage? something. Yeah, just even if you did minimum wage, you could make up this difference. Yeah, the court said even a minimum wage job could have significantly closed the gap between her monthly expenses and the income that was necessary to equally care for the child and maintain the level of care and lifestyle to which he was accustomed. I think now would also be a good time to talk about most of this comes up with imputing income and they look at um, the ability and the opportunities for employment and we deal with this a lot more so than we deal with the work seek orders yeah so so it's different this is a whole different thing than asking the court to impute income uh, and we should talk about that but before we do that let me uh, say that the appellate court um, looked at this decision and said that, you know, nobody has argued that there wasn't a recurring gift. Now, we're talking about Alter and Williamson, Mm -hmm. Alter being the appellate court decision that says that if there's evidence that a party is receiving reoccurring gifts as income, then the court can properly impute that income. Williamson, on the other hand, showed that if there's evidence that the recurring gifts were had stopped and there there's no evidence that it's going to continue then the trial court cannot so neither party really argued apparently that that it was reoccurring but what she argued was there's no evidence that once i get a job that that recurring gift will continue and what did the appellate court say about that they did not buy that argument at all yeah they said absent evidence that uh, the wife's employment would trigger an end to the gifts, the court did not abuse its discretion assuming the gifts would continue. So, you know, going into this thing, for her to make that argument, she probably needed to put a parent on the stand to say, this is only until she finds work. Exactly. Which, of course, wasn't going to happen, right? No. She's getting, she's getting that money no matter what. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the earning capacity thing that you were talking about. So uh, we've done a couple of together. We're doing one right now. And what's, how does it work? So how we do it, um, when we go to court, we bring a lot of uh, employment opportunities based on, this is usually after we have taken a deposition. If we have not been able to, we will do our best to figure it out. Um, But we will look on all the job sites, find jobs that are tailored to the opposing party, and then you do an excellent job of showing these job opportunities and asking if you know, the opposing party could handle this. And you will usually go step by step of, you know, could you, for example, if it was someone who had uh, experience in bookkeeping, could you do Excel records? Could you use QuickBooks? Could you be available nine to five Monday through Friday? Could you get to uh, Monrovia? Could, you know, just step by step. That's how we show that there is the opportunity to work. Yeah, and sometimes people pay for vocational examiners to do it, which is the real quality way. You get some professional uh, vocational examiner to come in, interview the party, and then that examiner will do their own homework. They'll come up with lots of job opportunities, and they could talk about how the market is out there. But there are occasions where people can't afford that. 
and the courts have allowed us to do what I call the poor man's vocational examination, That's which is all what you I've, just described. Yeah, I've never actually been able to have a vocational examiner. Um, I have worked on a case where there was one before we came on, but I have not had the pleasure. Yeah, well, um, actually, it's it's just as fun, I think, and I haven't seen uh, it not succeed, you know, so sometimes it may, maybe it's the best thing to do, but when you're looking at the job opportunities, there's certain criteria that you have to be really careful yes. with. What are they? So we... I, I, we had a case where it didn't go as well uh, because we had a client who wanted to pick them out himself. Um, and there were certain requirements that the opposing party did not did not meet. It was, um, you know, two years of college or an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. Or specific uh, experience in a work field. You know, five yeah, years like, experience in whatever the, the, the yeah, job Yeah, it's like offered. five years in, uh, you know, recept- in a doctor's office right. or something like that where the opposing party could definitely have done the job. Um, everything else matched up, but those requirements are really important. And it's not something you always think to look at because it's a little bit at the end of the, you know, of the list. It, it, it talks about everything that you need to do for them, and you're like, this is great, this is great. And then, but those requirements are yeah. really important. Yeah. So there's three basic things that I know you have to look for when you're looking at these job opportunities. You want to look at the, maybe there's four, there's the geography. You don't want to find jobs that are in a different county or a different state, right? Something that is reasonable for commuting to. Which is now very easy to figure out with all the websites. Yeah. So you can put in your, you know, your, I don't know, 10 miles out from a certain, wherever opposing party lives. Yeah. The other thing is, is uh, what is the qualifications. We talked about that. You know, does it require a bachelor's degree where your client doesn't have? Does it require uh, an experience? No. The other thing that you have to find in there is is uh, the salary. Because if the job opportunity doesn't say how much that job pays for, then the court has no evidence to mm-hmm. pay. So really a lot of attention has to be done, you know, with respect to the job opportunities. I think also, you know, obviously getting some new job opportunities, you know, you don't want to be relying on one that was a year ago or something like that. We try to refresh every time we go to court. Um, like one of the cases I'm talking about, we have gone out, I think, two or three times. And each time we have new job opportunities yeah. because exactly what you're saying, these jobs go stale. And then I think an easy argument for them to make would be that this job doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there are some cases where the court is going to have some pity on the person that you're trying to impute income to. Because if you impute income, what happens is that the trial court is going to say, okay, you're not working that job. And by the way, there doesn't have to be any evidence that that job is, that particular company or entity is going to hire this person. Mm -hmm. You don't have to show that. And you don't have to show that the person applied for that job. But what would happen if the court grants your request, it will put the income there on the uh, supported party side of the column, which will drastically reduce child and spousal support. I think that's something maybe our viewers might not know, that child support is really just a calculation. We, you know, we get clients who come in sometimes and say, he makes you know a million dollars, she makes this much, I should get at least like 50% or, or something like that. And support is really just an algorithm that has been set up by the court. There's really not, I mean, there's nothing we can do for the most part. Uh, for the calculation. Support. Yeah. yeah. We, we could do something with regard to what goes into that, mm-hmm. such as judge put the, this uh, uh, amount of money on her side of the column based upon the earning capacity. Um, but now let's talk about the work seek order. Okay. So as I look at this decision, I was thinking this is just one more tool that we could use either one way would be to me is you do an earning capacity argument and in the alternative judge if you're going to fi- not impute income to her we ask for a work seek order i think that's a great idea you know idea. what i mean or usually what a court will do is it'll, it'll if it's going to impute income it's going to say i'm going to give you nine months to find a job but at the nine months that's when the it's going to kick in right or i guess you know early on in a divorce proceeding you know, or a custody proceeding for a parental action, you would maybe ask for a work seek order right away because 
it's not fair to completely impute income to somebody. And they won't. You know, I mean, the, yeah. the court won't. But to say, okay, we got a work seek order, so within six months or whatever. Again, I, you know, there are courts that will say no. I just know that. You know, the child is too small. You know, uh, you know, she's she's better off staying and tending to the child, which might be true. There's another counter argument to this, and that is, is that look, all I'm qualified is to earn, you know, minimum wage. Or because of the responsibility of this child, I can't go back into the profession I was in, so it's got to be less money. And the argument is is that then I have to pay for daycare expenses. He's got to pick up one half of the daycare expenses at least. Sometimes it's proportionate. So it doesn't make sense at all because his support's not going to drop, and I'm going to be working, and it's not in the best interest of the child for, to impute or have me do the work sick order. So so the viewers should know, you know, in sum here, what we're talking about are – things to consider, but they're not fail-proof, you know, ways of modifying support because it is absolutely in the uh, discretion of the court, and it just depends on the facts of the case. Maybe a work-seek order is better for a child who's in school because then... Well, that you kind of got that feeling yeah. here, right, because this child was in preschool. It and seems it, like that they focused on that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Maybe the decision would have been different if this child was just two years old, mm -hmm. you know, but the fact that the court of appeals said, well, the trial court could properly decide that while the child wasn't working, there was no reason why you, I meant a child, why the child was in school that you should be working. And that, that yeah. weren't, they were going to find that the trial court erred in that. I mean, and they weren't saying that she needs to go become, I don't know, a high power, you know, executive or anything like that where your hours are crazy. They were saying even part time would be okay. Um, so I think, I, I think it's something to consider for our clients going forward. Yeah, cool. Well, now we've uh, analyzed a great case. You did a great job of summarizing everything for us. Uh, I look forward to you coming back next time for our next case. Me too. Okay, and thank you for joining us on Exhibit A.